welcome again, um, wherever you are from. And this is um, Columbia University GSAP Urban Planning Program Information Session. And I'm very glad you are able to join us today. I am Wei Ping Wu, the program director here for the master's program, as well as uh, other um, a faculty here. And uh, later during this hour, we'll have a group of current students join me. But I thought in the first uh, half hour or so, I will outline the program, uh, introduce our curriculum, and also introduce our support of students. And if you have questions, feel free to jot down in the chat box. I will also be able to answer some questions later on, especially if we have time. If not, um, we'll try to answer also in the chat box. Okay, so very glad you all decided to look at graduate education, especially urban planning. And why study urban planning? One study urban planning in New York City and Columbia University. So I, I don't think I necessarily need to convince you because if you are here, I think you are really interested. Uh, just a quick um, uh, overview, right? There are about 90 or so planning programs in the United States and nearly all of them are at master's level. So in the planning field, a master's degree is actually quite important in getting meaningful jobs and careers. And in New York City, studying planning uh, is a terrific um, location and laboratory because there are a wide range of urban issues. And for instance, um, with urban technologies, AI and digital uh, landscape, uh, the digital divide remains and in fact, in some ways deepens and New York City is a really productive way, a place to study that. Some of our students have done that. And I don't have to say more about climate change and its impact on coastal cities and other cities. New York obviously is, has felt the brunt of it. But we use New York not only as a laboratory, we use New York uh, as a place to introduce other professionals as adjunct faculty into the program. We, however, go well beyond New York City. And in fact, New York is a great uh, city for its global connections. Our program has taken full advantage of that. So as you can see in this uh, photo, our students we're doing a studio in Canada, looking at First Nation communities and their ways of connecting art space uh, with community building. So with that in mind, you know, our location, our advantage, and the importance of a graduate education in urban planning in a great urban laboratory, I also want to tell you another key feature of our program is our agility our flexibility, and how we try to stay on top of what's happening beyond the campus and beyond the city and around the world, right? So you can see in the last few years, we've had a number of new courses, and these courses have tended to be in a number of cluster areas that are the key strengths of the program, right? That include built environment, social justice oriented community and economic development courses, international types of courses, and then um, urban analytics. As you can see, we even have two new required courses that fall into some of those cluster uh, ex expertise areas. And beyond courses, we also have a lot of extracurriculum uh, activities. In fact, sometimes our students would say maybe a little too much <laughs> because lots happening, lots going on on campus. This is just urban planning program or uh, organized um, weekly lecture series. And we invite scholars, practitioners from around the world indeed, now that we're back in person fully and to talk about their research, their practice on a variety of topics. And we, you know, I have to admit, we are quite expensive. 
And so that flexibility of curriculum design and program design is to allow you and all of the students who are here to take courses across campus. We also have a number of dual degree programs with GSAP programs beyond urban planning. And some of you maybe international students are interested in STEM related degrees. So there are two degree programs um, that we have dual degrees that are STEM as I have listed. Beyond GSAP, we also have uh, five dual degree programs uh, with different schools. Again, uh, the MBA is STEM related. So some students would apply um, right now to, to schools, or you can come in and try one of one side of any of the dual degrees and apply to the other side during your first year here. And most excitingly, this year we started a, an exchange program with University College London, the Bartlett School of Planning, arguably the most well-known planning school around the world. Uh, so every spring semester, we're able to have up to four students of the first year students uh, to go over to Bartlett and they will send students uh, reciprocally to us. So let me spend a little bit more time on the program, on the curriculum, so that you get acquainted with that. Nothing beats a really well-read application that really uh, kind of shows your understanding of our program. And later on, I will also uh, talk a little bit about how you can enhance your application. So Kian, our assistant director, is going to type in some uh, web links. So one is our uh, main website URL, and then the other in which you can actually go from our main website to an information page for prospective students specifically. There you'll be able to see lots of student sample work, uh, studio reports, as well as um, you know, extracurriculum types of things, career services, student magazine, and so on and so forth. In fact, Kian, if you could also highlight that booklet that is available on our main website, as well as the um, open house website, where you can download the PDF that, that has even more information with course descriptions, uh, with the faculty descriptions, with the student organization description, career service description. That is the wealth of information that you will get. In fact, probably more than coming to talk to one of us. In any case, so the program has a very rich history. As you can see, we're one of the oldest planning programs around the country. We also have a PhD program. The same set of full-time faculty teach in both programs. And these faculty, especially the full-time faculty, are very productive, are very, um, what we say, well-known uh, faculty around the country and even actually globally uh, within the planning field, as well as to some extent beyond the planning field. Even more proudly, I, um, I, I have to say in the last seven to eight years, we've built up an excellent group of adjunct faculty at any given time during an entire academic year, we'll have about 40 adjunct faculty members. This list is simply a sample of them. All of them have really important positions and meaningful positions around New York City, some even beyond New York City, both in public sector, nonprofit, private consulting, as well as former experiences in international organizations. And they come in, most of them teach one course during the whole year, like for one semester, but they are very much connected to our students uh, through courses. Uh, in fact, almost all of them have been with us for multiple years, but we do attract new uh, adjunct faculty just about every year. And so we have some turnaround in the sense that people moving on to their next career, but also we identify new topics to uh, create new classes. So we will have new adjunct faculty. And many of our students have done internships or even uh, obtained careers in places where some of these adjunct faculty 
uh, actually work in. So these are wonderful resources and you'll get to know them once you become students. And I would say um, unanimously, our students are very, very uh, enthusiastic about our adjunct faculty. You can ask you know, the students later. Okay, so the curriculum is 60 credits or points, and it's full time for that. We are very much of a daytime program, we're not nighttime program, and we are accredited by the Planning Accreditation Board. I happen to chair that board as well, so I would say I know a lot about planning programs uh, elsewhere in the country, so I will be able to explain a little bit of how we compare to other planning programs. So compared to most planning programs, we actually don't have a uh, as heavy of a required course load. So that's 27 points less than half. Most planning programs require more than half of their credits to be required. We instead um, uh, allow a lot more flexibility. So you need to take 33 points of electives. Within our program, we are very strong in these five areas. And so you need to take up no less than 12 points from uh, electives from these clusters. And uh, these clusters really reflect our strength of faculty and uh, uh, research. And so we are somewhat unlike places like MIT or Rutgers or Berkeley, uh, which all are bigger in terms of their full-time faculty size and also more comprehensive in terms of expertise coverage. So we are probably closer to Harvard in a way that we have selective strength and especially in global, but I think we're stronger, I have to say that, uh, than Harvard in terms of data analytics. We are among one of the first programs in planning to have really strong analytic coverage in our curriculum. And then for the other, right, uh, 33 minus 12 is 21. You can take any elective courses at GSAP. Uh, in fact, all GSAP electives are open to all GSAP students. So some of the GSAP courses that are required of other programs like uh, design studios or some of the real estate um, program required courses are not open to uh, us. So, or to other students. And then we also share with students a list of courses that we consider relevant across Columbia. And, uh, and there's a strong list, like two, two full pages. And uh, many of our students have taken them, so we know they are really good. And we keep updating them every year. But if any student finds a course that really is of interest to them and not on the list, I we have a very, uh, you know, rapid way of approving that. And last but not least, we also have a part-time option. Uh, this is important. Only those of you who have already, by this point, have had two years full-time working experience or four years part-time working experience in planning-related fields. Again, we define that pretty broadly. And so if you're just starting working, that's probably not good. So if you have any questions about whether or not you qualify for the part-time option, please reach out to us directly, uh, meaning Kian or myself, um, because the admissions office will not be able to determine that and will be able to uh, um, uh, look at it, send, send us your resume and uh, and then we'll be able to make a decision very quickly. And our part-time uh, option is not for taking a course a semester like that. We try to um, encourage our part-time students to complete in four years. That means they take half of the course load each semester. Okay, so as you can see, uh, the first year of your curriculum is very intensely you know, uh, engaging required courses. Our students, uh, it's really nice in a way they take courses together um, several days of a week or a few days a week. And so they get to know each other really well. And then by the second year, then you it's free exploration, right? Except 
of the thesis and then you can take all sorts of electives and um, and so that's how we built that and so I want to show then a little bit of the uh, details of each of our cluster areas so we have the studio right so here you can see in the second semester of the first year you would do a studio that's six points and so our studios, half of them are travel studios that go to different parts of the world. So this was in last spring, students went to Paraguay in uh, Atongtiung, uh, working with an informal community. So it, basically travel studio works in a way that in the middle of the semester, the students go to the site for about a week. So build environment obviously has the largest number of electives. So you might have seen in other planning programs, such as let's say MIT or Berkeley or Rutgers, they will say they have transportation planning as their strength, or North Carolina Chapel Hill will have land use planning as their strength. What we try to do here is to introduce the various different topics on the built environment all in this cluster. So we have land use planning class, we have environmental planning class, we have transportation, but we don't have quite as in-depth courses in those areas. So say if you wanna be a transportation um, uh, specialist, especially if you're interested in transportation modeling, um, driverless cars and so on and so forth, you can come here, but you will need to take courses at civil engineering or you know, in the engineering school, or I would say go to another. Uh, program. Any of these programs that are accredited by PAB are going to give you very meaningful education. So I'm actually totally comfortable if you say, I'm sorry, I'm not coming. I don't take any offense. Anyway, so climate adaptation and planning is our newest cluster area and the newest, newest strength. Um, this actually started by a number of students about five or six years ago who really wanted us to um, branch out and we did and I think that's an excellent decision we have because Columbia University about four years ago created a new school called Climate School so there are lots of courses there we also participate in the Climate Schools all Ivy career fairs so um, this is a set of courses that will be really critical for a lot of you who are looking into this new directions of work um, beyond the traditional planning jobs in fact I want to draw your attention to how we actually structure these um, courses and curriculum. We really want to prepare professionals, not only capable of working in more traditional planning jobs, but also who, uh, who are ready to meet the emerging demands uh, for planners in uh, newer areas, right? Like urban tech, climate adaptation and planning, and what have you, right? So, or even post-disaster, post-crisis planning, especially around the globe in areas that really call for such attention. So we have courses that are, are not typical of many other planning programs around the country. I mean, I've seen lots and lots of curricula around the country in planning programs, I, I'm very proud to say we probably have the most comprehensive coverage of emergent topics that are closely related to planning, if not right on target, right? So community and economic development here, we also have a range of courses. And one area I want to identify is actually more housing, especially affordable housing, because New York City has a very vibrant a nonprofit housing sector. We also have quite a bit information on uh, our courses on infrastructure, which tends not to be a focus of study for many master's programs in planning across the country. International planning and development, I don't have to say more. We are the most um, global oriented program, I would, I, I think, maybe MIT and Harvard. Um, but I think we're more than Harvard. MIT has a lot of global coverage, but they have a bigger full-time faculty. So in the international cluster, we do not try to say cover every region comprehensively. That's impossible. 
what we try to do is to help our students to develop a mindset in a way of if you know we see many cities around the world face similar challenges, but the local context, the laws, the political system are all very different. So when we go to a different place, like the studio in Paraguay, what kind of questions should we be asking first? How do we say we learn about all of these you know, innovative and pragmatic sometimes solutions in American cities or in Paraguay? How do we say they may or may not work in other situations or to what extent they may work? So we really try to help our students get that kind of a mindset, ability for critical analysis, and ability to situate themselves in a new setting um, more quickly. Urban analytics, again, very, very strong. We try to help students on multiple fronts of urban analytics. It's not just about coding or machine learning. It's also about how you construct data how you design a data collection process. Then of course, once you get data, how you clean, how you use it to analyze, how you use it to uh, uh, categorize like in machine learning. But last but not least is how then you use the results and findings from such big data analysis to inform decision-making or to increase transparency in decision-making. And then, we, of course, we have a couple of skills courses uh, for especially students who are not um, familiar with some of the uh, more uh, professional skills. And so these are really important. I would say project management, for instance, very few planning programs offer that, and we do. And then the fundamentals of urban digital design are especially good for students who have had no um, visualization and design skills. So this is one of the products of our students building sensors and using sensors to collect data. And in the last few minutes, I wanna say a bit about our professional development and we have a multiple layered um, advising system. Kia and I are mostly academically advising and our associate director, Douglas Woodward, which I think he has typed in his uh, contact and then faculty advisors, and then we have student mentors. So when you are coming in, you will have multiple people to go to for advice, for suggestions. Of course, your student peers are probably some of the best advisors uh, for that. And then our student organization really try to uh, help with that. So career services, again, I'm really proud to say that we have some of the most extensive career services in any planning programs around the country. So for instance, I don't, I think you can see this well, right? Oops. So one-on-one -on -one career advising with Douglas Woodward, lots of workshops, lots of networkings, right? We do a mixer with alum every semester in a dive bar, really nice. And then we take about 25 students to every single APA annual conference. And then we do a reception there. We have career fairs across the school so that you can actually even talk to architecture firms if you are continuing to be interested, if your background is from there. Then we have a mentoring program one-on-one -on -one with alumni. So this year we placed 35 graduating students with alumni around the world, really. And you know some students are not interested. If you know all 50 students are interested, we'll be able to place uh, all of them. In fact, I was so proud that um, out of about 1,300 uh, alums from this program in the last, I don't know how many years, many, many years, <laughs> uh, I think we have come up, we've tallied something close to 230 alum who have had extensive engagement with us in the last seven to eight years. So we really have good connections with them. And Based on their experience, we have um, compiled this list of career pathways uh, that you can consider. And so about 12 or 13 of these, uh, the details of this uh, are all in that booklet that, uh, that is available on our website that you can download. 
and um, and Kian has typed in those links. And then subsequently, we recommend you take certain kinds of courses. And then those ex uh, examples are also places where alums have worked or are working in. So in that booklet, we also have placement of our alums in the last 10 years, as well as our internships in the last 10 years. You will see, obviously, um, for those students who decide to stay in the United States, about 60 to 70 percent of uh, the graduate state around New York area. We have a big cluster in California, but lots of international students do go back home uh, and work where they're most familiar with. So yes, as you can see the second page, um, we have a, a broad range of organizations that are not traditionally planning offices that our alums work in. And every year we also have a handful of students applying for doctoral studies and we have doctoral students or doctoral graduates in just about all of the planning doctoral programs around the world. Not all, many. And there are about 30 planning PhD programs around the country, right? So more information if you're interested uh, later. So just to show some images of career fair across uh, the school, and uh, as you can see, that we have students, we have alums. So the HR and A, a very um, critical consulting firm here in New York and nationwide. All those three uh, uh, alums, you know, are very happily working there and representing their employers. And we have a magazine called Urban by our students. Uh, every year, three uh, second year students are editors uh, with compensated work to put together an issue, and then three or so first-year students become um, assistant, uh, assistant editors to work with them. And this is one thing I'm also very proud of, is our urban planning lounge. So I know a lot of you who have studied in the United States, either for high school or college, you don't have a homeroom. We sort of have a homeroom, right? So you, you do take lots of classes in different places, but you can always retreat to this lounge. And then next to the lounge in the same suite uh, are two rooms. One is a computer lab with 30 high powered computers with anything you would want ever software all uploaded. And, uh, and then another room is a classroom that holds about 20 to 24 students. And so some of the UP classes are taking place there. And then we have the ability to enlarge space by knocking down wall, literally, but actually it's a folding wall that we can do a large scale events in the space. So this is where lots of planning students hang out. And it's hard to say we can accommodate a hundred students there. I don't think we can. So we have about 110 students between the two years, but I would say sometimes half of them are there at any given time. So, so this is a really nice feature. So last, let me spend a minute or two to look at how you can enhance your application. So we really very much do a comprehensive review. Um, with the Supreme Court decision in, in spring 2023, we actually do not uh, review your demographic information during the review process. Uh, we do collect, but we don't, uh, the, the information is sort of hidden at the school level. So uh, at the program level, when we review applications, we do not see them. Um, Every single application gets three people, three faculty to review. And literally, you know, we have to discuss sometimes if our uh, views are somewhat different. And our students come from a variety of background. Architecture is probably the biggest undergrad uh, major and then followed by uh, urban planning, geography, urban studies, environmental studies, uh, other social sciences, and then engineering. And we have scientists, biology, um, and then artists such as uh, photography or visual arts, you name it. Our students come from everywhere. And so whatever experience you have, especially experience about cities and so on, um, will be relevant, especially in your personal statement. Tell us why 
um, you want to come to study planning, maybe what you even want to do after you get a planning degree, uh, why, uh, you know, certain areas of courses are attractive to you from our program. And more importantly, since we're not requiring GRE, it's, you know, optional. If you're taking it, great, include that. If you don't want to take it, please, please make sure you spend no less than one paragraph, no less than one paragraph, maybe even more in your personal statement to tell us the kind of analytical experience you've had either in, uh, in school or beyond school. And that could be quantitative or qualitative or both, right? So we do want to know because planning courses, especially the required courses, some of which will have a significant analytical contents, you are, once you re enrolled in the program, required to acquire both quantitative and qualitative skills. That is required by the Planning Accreditation Board. So we do cover all of them in our curriculum. And then in terms of, finally, in terms of assistance, or scholarship. So during admission season, some students will be admitted with scholarship and you will know uh, in the admission letter that will come to you probably towards uh, latter part of March or actually early part of March, sometime in March. And then we do not offer anything else during admission. So TAs and RAs are only for matriculated students. So once you uh, decide to come in, you matriculate, the summer before you start your first year, you'll get a notice of how to apply for TA and RAs. And then we'll have a merit scholarship for second year students and then need-based scholarships, again, also for matriculated students. Okay, so um, these are the links already. Uh, Kian put has already put in the chat box. So um, the best way to reach us is through this um, email, which Kian probably can put in also in the chat box. And that will reach all three of us. That's me, Kian, and Douglas Woodward. And we can then um, uh, triage to see who will uh, be uh, best to answer your questions. But generally, Kian will be your best resource. 